Episode 145 of the Read to Lead podcast is brought to you by cloud accounting software FreshBooks, offering a 30-day unrestricted free trial to you. To claim it, just go to freshbooks.com slash read to lead and enter read to lead in the how did you hear about us section. Human beings make subconscious, emotional, often irrational decisions in one place in the brain, and then they justify those decisions later rationally in a different place in the brain. Welcome to the Read to Lead podcast with Jeff Brown. Jeff believes that if you desire to achieve true success in business and in life, then consistent and intentional reading is a must. The Read to Lead podcast will not only help you narrow this ever important reading list, but also bring you key insights and valuable feedback from some of today's most successful and inspiring authors. And now, here's Jeff. Hello to you and welcome to the podcast. It's dedicated to your personal and professional growth, where we dig into leadership and also things like personal development, productivity, career, business, marketing, sales, and entrepreneurship. It's sales getting the focus today, as you and I are going to sit down with Paul Smith. He's the author of Sell with a Story, How to Capture Attention, Build Trust, and Close the Sale. I'll ask Paul about sales stories and the advantages they give us, uh, the sales stories you need and when to tell them, how to craft your sales stories, and a lot more. As a business owner, I have found Paul's book to be tremendously helpful in highlighting the places where I could be doing a much better job of leveraging story to help grow my business. I think you'll find it and our conversation extremely valuable. Speaking of which, probably like you, I find that my time is the most valuable asset that I have, and I love it when I get some of it back. And that's the case when I use cloud accounting software FreshBooks. They're our sponsor for this episode. FreshBooks software has always been easy to use, but with the relaunch a few weeks ago of an all new version of their software, it has become even easier to use and it's completely transforming how freelancers and small business owners, people like me and you deal with day-to-day paperwork. The software has helped make me more productive, more organized, and uh, probably as important as anything else, I get paid a lot faster. You understand, I am not a numbers person, and FreshBooks is extremely simple, I think, especially if you're not a numbers person. Every time I use FreshBooks, I like to say it's like I'm putting on a cape because to my wife, it makes me look like a superhero with the time that I get back. Whether it's tracking mobile expenses, the automated late payment reminders, their awesome support, the ease of online payments, and more, I highly encourage you to check out cloud accounting software, FreshBooks. It is completely free to do so right now because you listen to the show. They're offering a 30-day unrestricted free trial. And to claim it, all you need to do is go to freshbooks.com slash read to lead and enter read to lead in the how did you hear about us section. Again, that's freshbooks.com slash read to lead. Paul Smith is a popular speaker and expert trainer on business storytelling techniques. He's a former Procter & Gamble executive and his clients include uh, Hewlett Packard, Bayer Medical, Progressive Insurance, Walmart, and a number of other distinguished companies. And as the author of Lead with a Story and Parenting with a Story, his work has been featured in the Wall Street Journal, Inc., Time, Forbes, The Washington Post, one of my favorite magazines, Success, and Investors Business Daily. Paul is also the author of the book we're talking about today, and that's a good thing. It's called Sell with a Story, (laughs) How to Capture Attention, Build Trust, and Close the Sale. Paul, welcome officially to Read to Lead. Hey, Jeff. Thanks very much for having me on. I'm I'm very happy to be here. Well, I thought we would start off the conversation in much the same way as you start off the book and have you share a bit about the purpose of the book, what it's designed to do, but also what it isn't designed to do. Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. In fact, let me start with a what it's not. Um, it, it's definitely not supposed to be everything you need to know about being an effective salesperson. You know, so it's not a a comprehensive book on selling. In fact, it, it it's not even offering a, a new sales method to replace the one you're using today. Uh, the the purpose of the book is to add a specific skill set to your current process, and that skill set is called storytelling. Um, and, and again, it's not to replace what you're doing today. It's to add to it. So specifically two things, uh, were my purpose in the book. Uh, part one is really to illustrate the, the 25 types of sales stories that you probably need in your repertoire of sales stories. And part two is all about how to craft those and deliver them. So that's things like, uh, the structure of a story and emotion and surprise and dialogue and detail and lengths and 
telling stories with data and all and those those kind of things. But the, the the first part is what stories you need to tell. The second part is how to tell them. Well, as I read chapter one, I found that I uh, was sometimes guilty of calling something a story that isn't really a story. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And so you're not alone in that. Yeah. Yeah. So simply put, share with us what is a sales story, maybe some of the attributes that make up uh, a story. Yeah, so I can do that. And it's probably best if I also give you an example um, to make it more clear. But um, yeah, I'm trying to distinguish in, in the book between a sales story and a sales pitch. And I think everybody's familiar with a sales pitch or a, a presentation or a, a memo or something. Right. You know, Jeff, here are the three reasons why you should buy my product. One, two, three. That's a sales pitch. Uh, a story is something very different. It, it, it's, uh, it has a time and a place and there's a main character in it, probably other characters. You know, those characters have goals. They're, there's typically an obstacle getting in the way of the main character achieving their goal. And there are events. You know, so those are kind of the six attributes of what you would call a story. Anybody would call that a story. It's a narrative about something that happens to somebody as opposed to a list of reasons why you should do something. So if you could indulge me, I'll, I'll give you an example, um, one that actually happened to me and my wife last year. Um, we, we were at an art fair and she was looking for a piece of art for our kids' bathroom at home. And we got to this uh, one booth of this underwater photographer and she just got attached to this this picture. And it was literally a picture of a pig in the ocean. And I just thought that was the silliest thing, right? I mean, pigs don't swim and they certainly aren't ocean dwelling creatures. And, <laughs> and it wasn't a painting. It was a photograph, you know, so I, I just thought that was odd. And I, we, I got a chance to ask the artist, you know, what, you know, what's up with this picture of the pig in the ocean? How did you get that pig in the ocean? And he said, Oh, it was the craziest thing. He said, you know, that picture was taken off the coast of this uninhabited Island in the Bahamas called Big Major K. And he said, apparently what happened was a few years ago, a local entrepreneur bought a bunch of pigs to raise uh, on a bacon farm, I guess. And he found this uninhabited island. He could keep them on for free. So he puts them out there. And he said, but if you look in the picture behind the pig up up on the beach, you'll you'll notice there's really not much more than cactus up there. And he said, so the, the pigs weren't, weren't thriving, right? They, they, they couldn't find much to eat. And he said, fortunately for them, some local restaurant owner on a neighboring island started boating his kitchen refuse every night over to Big Major K and dumping it a few dozen yards offshore. So pretty soon, these hungry little pigs, they smell the food and, you know, they brave the waters. And first it's one pig and then it's two. And, you know, now it's three generations later and all the pigs on Big Major K can swim. And he said, so it just made it easy for me to get the picture because all I had to do was stick my my camera out of the boat. Normally, I've got to get my scuba equipment on and go <laughs> under the water, and it's a, this big ordeal. But they've learned that approaching boats means they're going to get fed. And so so they learned to swim. And, of course, at that point, I've already got my credit card out. And I'm like, OK, I got to have this now. <laughs> right? I mean, you know, this is absolutely going to be in, at my house now. And the, the reason was because of the story, not because the picture was, you know, r- remarkable. It, it was a remarkable picture, but I wasn't going to mm. pay for it and, <laughs> until I heard the story. And then, you know, it, the, now I was buying a story, not mm. just a picture. So the, the, the story made the picture so much more valuable. So that was a sales story that he told me. Now, he didn't intend it to tell me that to get me to buy the picture. He told me because I asked him a question, but it was a wonderfully effective sales mm. story. You notice he didn't say, you, you got to buy this picture because it's the right size for your bathroom. It's got the right color scheme to match with your current, you know, uh, whatever in there, the paint on the walls in there. And it's the right price, you know, for a, a picture for your bathroom. Plus your wife loves it. So you got to, you know, and it wasn't, that would have been a sales pitch. He told me a sales story. And that that speaks that that example speaks to some of the advantages for telling them in the first place. A story activates a certain part of the brain that isn't otherwise activated, yeah. right? Uh, and, in, and in your case, you saw at first just a picture of a pig in the ocean, but now the story in your mind increases the value of that item. Right, it does. In fact, that's one of the many reasons why I think storytelling works. In fact, there was a there was a study that was done where these uh, these guys went and bought a bunch of uh, just, just junk, really, at uh, flea markets and garage sales and stuff like that, and you know things that you buy for a dollar or two, and and they sold them on eBay, but instead of putting a description along with the picture of the item, they put the picture of the item and they put these silly stories with them. And they were obviously made up 
stories, but no description, just a story. And they ended up selling them for hundreds of times what they <laughs> paid for these things because there was just a story with it. It just, it just it proves that people are – they're more willing to, to pay for a story than just an, an item. But but as you said, yes, yeah, stories also, they, they, they activate a part of the brain where decisions are actually made. And, and I think a lot of the cognitive science that we've, we've seen over the last couple of decades tells us that human beings make – subconscious, uh, emotional, often irrational decisions in one place in their brain. And then they justify those decisions later rationally in a different place in the brain. And, and sales pitches typically appeal to the rational part of the brain. And you need that, of course. But real decisions get made in that emotional center, and 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 sales pitches don't reach that that place. But <laughs> stories do. Stories are in in, a, in essence are are emotion delivery vehicles. So they they help you tap into the the other part of your brain that you need to make decisions. So there's a a, a couple of the reasons. But if if I could add one more, I, w- I would say um, a, um, an important one is that stories just make things easier to remember. I mean, you know, if I were to you – know, here, I've given you a list of three things now, but if I were to make it a four or five or six uh, list, by this time tomorrow, you you probably wouldn't remember this list of five or six things. But you will remember the story of Pig Island, mm. right? And, and next month and next year, uh, anybody listening to this will be able to tell the story of Pig Island and get most of the facts right. Mm. But none of you will remember this list of three things that I'm telling you about why story <laughs> why stories work. <laughs> you know, that's that's just the power of stories. And I appreciated the example, uh, too, in the book, I think in the same section uh, that gives the facts first. It goes, was it two legs sitting on three legs, eating one yeah. leg? And it's the boy on the stool with the chicken bone and the dog. Right. But when you tell <laughs> right. it just the facts, it's like there's no way you can remember that. But then when you hear it in the context right. of story, it completely opens your mind up to remembering everything, every detail. Yeah, absolutely. That that's good. You'll have to have people check that out. It's an entertaining <laughs> story, but but it's just meaningless as a list of facts. Yeah, great great reason right there alone to buy the book right there. <laughs> Paul says uh, your first objective in a sales call is to get buyers to open up and tell you their stories. Uh, two questions, Paul. One, why is this so important? And number two, what are some techniques we can use to get buyers to do that? Yeah, so it, it's important because. Uh, well, a couple of reasons. One is if if you don't hear their stories, how are you going to know which of your stories to tell? Mm. Um, but but also that's how you find out what it is that they really need. Um, and if you're going to sell them something, you need to sell them something they really need. And that's how you get to really understand their needs as opposed to just a, a list of of the desirables or or whatever. Um, and, and the way to to, to do that, I, I'll give you my my top three ways to do it. The first one, uh, maybe the most obvious, but probably underutilized, and it's just shut up and listen. <laughs> I mean, you know, nature abhors a vacuum and, and it's the same thing in conversation. Like we we just we can't leave a vacuum. We gotta fill it with our own voice. And if you just if you just pause and let that vacuum be there for a minute, it'll probably get filled with the buyer's voice. And they're more likely to tell you a story if you give them space to do it. Mm. But two very specific techniques for doing it. One is is asking open-ended questions as opposed to closed-ended questions. And so what I mean by that is, you know, don't ask yes or no questions or short answer questions. So um, it, you should be asking open-ended ones. So for example, instead of you asking, uh, what's your biggest problem right now? Which is going to get you an answer like, oh, uh, warehousing, that's our, that's our biggest problem, or delivery, or right. product quality, or something. Instead of asking that, ask, when did you know, or tell me about the moment you knew that your biggest problem was your biggest problem. Hmm. Then they're going to go, oh, that would have been the warehouse fire of 85. That really – and you know, and then they're going to tell you a whole story about the warehouse fire or the, the, the big product meltdown. or the, you know, They're going to tell you this great story that will allow you to really understand – What's the problem as opposed to them giving you just a yes or no or simple answer? Yeah. And then um, the, the last technique I guess I'd, I'd share is uh, – and this is definitely last, but tell your story first. So you know, if, if, if I tell you a story about my, my kids um, – my kid on the baseball team, you're going to tell me a story about your kid on the baseball team or the soccer mm-hmm. team or the whatever. You know, If I tell you a story about how my car broke down last week, you're going to tell me a story about how your car broke down last month. Right. It's, that's just the way human beings are. So mm. if you want your audience to tell you a story about a computer problem they're having, you tell them about a computer problem you're having. And it will just naturally elicit 
the kind of story that you're you're looking for. But de- but definitely do that last, right? Because you you first want to shut up and listen, right? right. And you second <laughs> want to ask the right kind of questions. And if those two fail you, then tell a story as an example, and that'll prompt the the kind of story you're looking for. And when you start telling stories about yourself, you, you get into that whole rapport building process, yeah. right? And going beyond just the career highlights in your bio and that sort of thing. Yeah, it, yeah, you do, and and uh, and so that's a great uh, place. In fact, uh, in all the the research I did with um, with uh, salespeople and buyers, in fact, I I ended up interviewing professional sales and people and professional procurement people at probably fifty or sixty companies around the world, and um, and and the rapport building part of the whole sales process was the part that I found stories being used the most. You know, so it's stories like. Uh, you know, explaining why it is that you do what you do or kind of who you are as a person, your, your, your values, um, you know, th- things like, uh, a couple of them that I found really interesting was, um, and I'll tell you when I made a mistake story mm. and I'll tell you when I can't help you story. And, and those were interesting because uh, one of the things I found out from the buyers, the professional procurement people was that there, those are two things that a salesperson can do very early on to immediately earn credibility. And that is, Tell me when you made a mistake and tell me when you're not the best solution for me, when you can't help me, you know, and, and they, they say that, you know, obviously if, if, uh, if you never tell them when you make a mistake, they're, they're less likely to find out about it. But, um, the whole a typical thing they complain about is that salespeople come in here and they tell me, oh, I got all your solutions. Any problem you've got, I can fix it. You know, we, we are your go-to <laughs> solution for everything. And that's just almost never the case, right? So if you'll be honest with me about when you're not the best solution, I'm much more likely to believe you when you tell me you are the best solution. But you can't just tell me, hey, Bob, you know, or Jeff in this case, <laughs> I'm, I'll always tell you when I, when I made a mistake and I'll definitely tell you when I can't help you. Well, why should I believe that? <laughs> but if you tell me a story about the last time you made a mistake with a client and you told them about it and – whatever repercussions came from that. Or the, you tell me a story about the last time that you told a, a customer that, look, I can't help you on problems two and seven, but mm. I'm, uh, I can help you on one, four and five, right? Mm. Then I'm more likely to believe you, right? So those are really mm. great early on stories to tell to earn credibility. Paul, what are some of, of the most useful kinds of stories you found in your research when it comes to the main sales pitch part of the process? Yeah, so so there, there are several there. Um, the, the, probably the most productive one is problem stories. So these are the kind of stories that illustrate the quintessential problem that your product or service is designed to solve, right? So in, instead of just telling them, "Look, we, uh, we solve logistics problems that blah, you know, blah 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 blah, whatever," <laughs> uh, tell them a story about somebody that had that problem. And then and this and this goes into the next type of story, which is a success story, which is and then tell them what your product did to solve it. Mm. Right. So as opposed to just giving them lists of features and benefits, actually couch all of that into a story about somebody that a real person, a real company that had a real problem and that you really solved it. Right. So those are those are two: a problem story and then followed by a success story. And then you already heard the, uh, the the Pig Island story is an example of a value adding story. So that's a story that mm. um, makes the product worth more. Um, the, the other one that I'd, I'd probably mention here is uh, just your your product's invention story. I mean, we, telling people the story of why and how and who invented the product or service that that you're selling really helps people understand uh, a lot more about the company and your values and what it is that you're selling and why you're selling it. Uh, because pe- people tend to not care as much about what you do until they know why you're doing it. And that's one of those stories that helps them understand that. Mm. Well, when it comes to handling objections, there are certainly a lot of different methods uh, for doing so, no doubt about that. And there's no reason, yeah. Paul says, uh, to do away with something that's working for you. But he also says, if you're not using stories as part of or in addition to those methods, you're missing out on a very practical tool. So, Paul, that begs the question, what are some ways we can work stories into this phase of the sales process? Yeah, and so, so you mentioned all the, you know, the existing methods, and gosh, there's a lot of them. You know, there's, uh, you know, listen, accept, commit, and explicit <laughs> action, or, you know, feel, felt, found, or and there's all, you know, all kinds mm-hmm. of these, and, and most of them work. I'm, I'm sure they do. Um, and again, I'm not, I'm not suggesting you get rid of those if they're working for you, but um, when, if somebody, in a, if you're in a sales call and your buyer brings up an objection, well, yeah, but, 
blah, 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 blah. Instead of saying, well, here are the three reasons why you shouldn't be worried about that. <clears throat> you, you can try that. <laughs> or you can say, well, um, one of my other clients had the same objection. And let me tell you what happened when he or she bought my product anyway. This happened and then this happened and this happened. And then we got to the point where they were afraid that this problem was going to happen and it didn't happen. Or it did happen and they pressed the other button and it fixed it. And so, <laughs> they, you know, it's not a problem. I mean, you know, so giving them an actual story of somebody confronting the problem they're worried about happening and it either never materializing or there was an easy solution to it. You know, that's just so much more compelling and convincing than just giving them another set of arguments why they're wrong. This is not, you shouldn't be worried about this, right? Mm. Um, one of those specifically, though, was about price. And so I, I found a number of interesting examples of salespeople using stories to help them uh, when the buyer objects to the price, uh, which is, uh, you know, a, a pretty common thing to happen. Mm. So um, a story to illustrate how, no, no, my product really is worth as much as I'm charging for it. And let me give you an example why. Here's somebody who paid that much for it. And then looking back, they're glad they paid that much for it because they got more, you know, more out of it or they're glad they, they made that decision. So again, just more compelling than a list of reasons. Well, what are your thoughts on how we can be more proactive, Paul, with handling objections, heading them off at the pass in, in some cases? Yeah, so that, that's one of those that I, I didn't expect to find when I started the research, but I found a number of people actually using these objection-resolving stories before the objection was even brought up. And I just I found that fascinating, but also brilliant. In fact, one of the examples, it's a guy named uh, Randy Locke who works at Amway, and he's uh, the head of research there. He's not even a, a sales guy. So what he's selling, if he, if I can use that word, is ideas. So his job is to recommend you know different strategy, rec, you know courses of action to management. And um, so often he meets an objection from senior management that's well, yes, but uh, we don't like that idea. We're going <laughs> to you know follow this idea, or this is our strategy. We've already committed to the strategy, and and he used to just argue with them and say, well, well, I think this and you think this and guess who wins those arguments, right? It's always the boss. <laughs> but then he started to just tell them a story, which was essentially the story of his research. And he would say, well, you know, boss, I thought the same thing. I was totally on board with your new strategy until I started looking into our research and I found this and I found this and when I, but then, and, and I was still totally on board with it. And then when I found this, Totally changed the way I think about it. Hmm. Now, I, I completely changed my mind. And and now I think this, and here's why. And and so here he is told, and I call this now a, a, a discovery journey story. So it, you start in the same intellectual space as your buyer that has an objection. And then you walk them down the path that you went on until you discovered the, whatever brilliant thing it is that you discovered hmm. that changed your mind. Because if it changed your mind, it'll probably change their mind. But it's just so much more effective when you tell it in that story because you're bringing them along with you into your journey. You're not just – it's not adversarial anymore. It's not, right. I'm right, you're wrong. No, 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 <laughs> I'm right, you're wrong. It's, no, 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 we were both wrong. <laughs> and, and and then we, and we were going along this journey together and then I found something that you didn't find because you weren't looking where I was looking. And so let me show that to you. And, and it, it just makes it so much more emotionally easy for them to accept – that uh, that the brilliance in that because they got to find it with you as opposed to it being you hitting them over the head with it. Mm. I love that. Uh, what about closing the sale, Paul? Uh, someone responds to you by saying, well, you know, this sounds great. Uh, we'll be ready in March. We'll get back to you in January uh, or what have you. What are some some of the more promising ways, I guess, to leverage story in, in closing the sale? So the the most common one I saw was creating a sense of urgency. So that is when you get to the end of the sales call and the buyer's like, oh, yes, I definitely want this. The price is right. The quality is right. I'm definitely going to buy this, but not right now. <laughs> I need to wait six months or whatever. Um, and so really, you've all the selling has been done. It's just and now it's just a matter of now I've got to wait six months for you, to, <laughs> you know. And so I found a number of people with really creative stories to help people see the, the downside of that. Um, and so literally it would be like, OK, I, so I get you. I've I've had people say that before. Let me tell you about one of them that waited, and they waited six months. And three months into their six-month waiting period, they got acquired by a larger company. And that made this happen, and that made this happen, and then – and now they can't buy our product because – for whatever reason, and they wish they had because their new job with the new company would be so much easier <laughs> if they bought what I was selling them six months ago when they said they were going to buy it, you know, but they waited. And so now they regret it. 
right? So that will help you create a, a sense of urgency. Mm. Um, an, another reason to, to tell stories at this point is that oftentimes salespeople aren't in the room with the decision maker when that decision, the buying decision is getting made because it's it's made by the board of directors or it's made by the president and, and you don't get audience with that person. And so what you want is for your sponsor inside the company to take all your sales materials and your presentation slides and your f- slick brochures and, <laughs> and kind of go make your sales pitch for you. That In an ideal world, that's, that's what would happen. But of course, they're not going to do that because – they don't want to, they're not salespeople. They don't want to be a salesperson. That's your job. Um, but what they will do is they'll share a story because it's easy for them to do and because they remember it and because they probably enjoyed listening to it when you told them that story. I mean, you would probably easily share the story of Pig Island now with somebody just because it's a fun, interesting story, right? But but you're not going to share my sales pitch for why you need to buy that picture. So that I call that an arming your sponsor with a story because it's something they can and will repeat when they get into the decision making room when you're not there to to sell your product. And that to me was one of the strongest arguments in this whole process uh, for leveraging story is because, you, like you said, you equip those sponsors to do the selling for you so much more more readily. Yeah. Well, Paul says that storytelling doesn't necessarily end once the sale is made, top salespeople continue to use it. So in what ways exactly, Paul? Yeah, so uh, another kind of set of surprises for me. I, I really assumed that uh, that would be the last chapter of the book, right? <laughs> once you've closed the sale, right. like we're done, right? Um, but I found three interesting types of stories uh, salespeople are telling after the sale. So one is, uh, I call it a service after the sale story. Um, and that is to help their their new clients better leverage the product or service that they just bought um, so that they'll be happier with the product or service so that they're more likely to stay uh, a, a customer, um, which kind of makes it similar to the next one, which is a loyalty building story. But in, in both cases, what you're doing is is sharing stories that helps them better appreciate and use what it is that they've now bought. And just so, for example, uh, w- one of my favorite examples from the book is from a uh, Backroads, which is an active travel company, and they need to get the people that come on vacation with them. They're, they're kind of a, a Sherpa guide that, you know, so they, they plan your, your vacation and then they go with you and they're your tour guide for the bicycle riding and the kayaking and the hiking and all that kind of stuff. And, and one of the stories that they will tell when they get to say that uh, tomorrow we're going to go biking and we got a difficult route, an easy route and a medium size route. Um, and if, if you happen to be a, not a very strong bicycler, you need to take the easy route <laughs> or you're going to get <laughs> stuck, uh, you know, before you get to the top of the hill or mm. you're not going to be happy. You're going to be hot, too hot and sweaty and tired. And, but they don't want to just tell people, look, Sally, we've seen you ride bikes for three days. Now we know you're awful at it. You need to take the, the easy route because that's just insulting. What they what they want is Sally to come to that conclusion herself. So what they will do is they'll tell a story about, well, you know, last week on this tour, um, we had some other people and one of the ladies named Rose was a a weak uh, bicycler, um, but she really wanted to take the difficult route. So what she did was she got up two hours earlier than everybody else. She got on the road early. We met her halfway with a snack on the road. Then we met her at the top of the hill with her lunch. And then by the afternoon, she was on the downhill side and she was able to keep up with everybody. OK, so now Sally can choose. Oh, that was smart because <laughs> I'm not a very good bicycler either. And I want to take that difficult route now. Now they've helped her come to that conclusion herself without telling her what to do. Right. right. So those are a, cu- a couple of types. The, the, the last one in this section, though, is, is really a story that you tell for the benefit of your fellow salespeople. It's it's summarizing the call. It's like uh, oftentimes your your sales calls they'll either be wonderful ones or awful ones, <laughs> and there's something to learn from those. When you when you have a very successful sales call, well, capture what happened in the call as a story to teach the rest of your colleagues what to do. And if you have an awful sales call and get thrown out of the buyer's office, share that story as well, and that'll teach people what not to do <laughs> in a sales call. <laughs> so those turn out to be very effective for you and your your team personally. Mm. Well, Paul's book, Sell With a Story, is divided into two parts, and pretty much all of my questions to Paul this far have come out of part one, which is called What Sales Stories You Need and When to Tell Them. Part two is called How to Craft 
sales stories. Before I get into a couple of questions, Paul, not directly related to the book, is there anything there from those 16 chapters you'd like to summarize for us? <laughs> well, yeah, just just to let folks know what what's in it, because like you said, the first part is what stories you need to tell. The whole, the, the whole second two thirds of the book is how to do it. So it's the structure of a story. It's how to use emotion in a story properly, uh, the element of surprise and using dialogue and how long should these stories be? Should they be long or short or two minutes or five minutes? And um, <clears throat> how do you tell stories with data? And what are the ethics of storytelling and sales? And where do I go find these stories? And how do I practice these stories? And how do I save them so I can remember them later? And, I mean, all the very practical mm. how to's of crafting these stories is that's what's all covered in that second half. So um, so I would encourage people to look for that as well. Excellent. Well, I want to ask you a question I ask uh, virtually everybody who uh, guests on the show, and that is the books that, that you're reading or have read recently, uh, Paul, that have had an impact on you. What are those books that uh, you like to go back to again and again? Yeah, you know, I, I'd probably just give you one, uh, and it probably may had the biggest impact on my decision to do what I do for a living mm-hmm. and write the books that I write, and that that's the uh, the book Made to Stick ah. by Chip and Dan Heath from back in uh, 2007 or eight. Um, and if you remember that book, it, it talks about six different things that great ideas, ideas that tend to spread and survive and thrive have. And one of those six things was that they're stories. Mm. And that really was one of the pivotal moments for me in recognizing the value of storytelling. And, and I I've kind of dedicated my career to the pursuit of understanding storytelling and teaching people how to do it well. Mm. Well, as someone who finds himself in front of uh, large groups of people to deliver talks fairly regularly, I would, I would love to hear from you, Paul, some of your tips for doing that well, doing that successfully. Yeah, well, it'll be no surprise to you that it's you should be telling more stories. <laughs> you know, I mean, lectures are boring, right? right? Bossing people around is insulting. So, you know, when when I do that as well, and I spend a lot of my time on stage in front of audiences, mostly what I'm doing is telling stories. I'm going from one story to another story to another story, and each of them has a lesson to be learned. You know, I could just stand up there and say, here are the three things you need to learn today, and I'd mm. be done in two minutes. And they'd walk out, and they'd forget those two things or three things immediately. Mm. You know, but if you share, if you use storytelling to to illustrate your points and to to to, to make your point, people will remember it. They'll be engaged in it while you're doing it. They'll enjoy it, um, and then they'll remember from it. So that's absolutely my first, second, third, and fourth piece of advice: <laughs> is tell stories instead of just lecture to people. Hmm. Well, uh, I know uh, that the book hasn't been out too awfully long, uh, so it, it may be too early to ask this, but I'd be curious to know uh, what's what's next for you, if, if you know that. What are you and your team working on now that uh, that you're excited about? Yeah, yeah. So it's only been out two or three weeks, yes. But uh, so so what I, we, I'm doing now is I've just developed a new training course based on the same research that went into the book. So I'm, I'm right now in the middle of rolling that out to new clients, you know, obviously, particularly sales teams, mm. you know, to teach them. How do you uh, become a better salesperson through the art and the science of, of storytelling? You know, for those people that don't want to just sit down and read the book, uh, to have a more of a hands-on training. But yeah, I've got my eyes on. You know, what is the next? I obviously have something of a brand franchise here with lead with a story and parenting the story and now sell with a story. So I, I, I need to be figuring out what's uh, what's next in that series and and get after it. I suppose. Chicken soup for a story. <laughs> I, mean, I think that one's been done. But yeah. Something like that. Uh, great, great. Well, Paul, thank you so much. Uh, I, I've enjoyed the book thoroughly, and I've I've seen uh, so many ways I could be utilizing story more when it comes to my sales calls and working with clients uh, in, in in the area of coaching and mentoring. And so I appreciate that very much. Thank you so much for taking time to to chat with us today and and for sharing uh, your work. We really appreciate it. Oh, you're very welcome, Jeff. Thanks so much for having me on. One quick and simple way to connect with Paul is to follow him on Twitter. He's at lead with a story on Twitter. That's at and then the words lead with a story on Twitter. I've listed all the resources and links Paul and I mentioned and talked about, including his book and the book he recommended at the show notes page created for this episode. You'll find that at read to lead slash 145 for episode 145. Sometimes an iTunes rating and review comes along that just makes your day or in this case, your week. I want to say thanks to James Killian, Senior Manager at Stage Force Inc. for his five-star rating and wonderful review in iTunes. He says, The Read to Lead podcast is the holy grail of business and life sense. He also calls it a must podcast for any serious-minded person seeking to excel in life 
and business. Wow. Thank you, James, so much for that. If you'd like to leave a rating and review in iTunes, you can do it by simply going to readtoleadpodcast.com slash iTunes. Well, that's going to do it for this week. I look forward to seeing you next time for the next episode of the Read to Lead podcast. Thanks so much for listening to the Read to Lead podcast. As a subscriber, we challenge you to be more than just a passive listener. Become a vital member of the community. Visit us on the web at readtoleadpodcast.com. Until next time, remember, leaders read and readers lead. Read to Lead.